This is Taking the Lead, a podcast for B2B tech professionals, leaders, and executives who want to learn from female icons in the tech industry. In each episode, host Christina Brady interviews women who are driving revenue for some of the most respected tech companies in the world. Are you ready to get inspired? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Taking the Lead. I am Christina Brady. I am your host, and I am the CEO and one of the co-founders of Luster. And I am thrilled today to have Miss Jody Mesa on the show. Jody, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here. <laughs> it's just like a couple of years in the making. And before we jump into all of the goodness that we are about to dive into, I would be remiss uh, if I didn't give a call out to our incredible partners and supporters, Women in Sales, Renegade Operations, and of course, Luster. As it pertains to women in sales, they are focused on elevating, empowering, and promoting women within the sales profession. And in order to realize this vision and create more equitable sales teams, they recognize everyone needs to be a part of that conversation and contribute towards the progress. So if you want to be a part of this unbelievable community and organization that is going to mold the future of sales to be more inclusive, head over to www.women-in-sales.com and join in on the conversation in Slack. And that brings me to Renegade Operations, where if you, like so many, are struggling with growing revenue with traditional frameworks and tactics and not getting anywhere, then you should be prepared to challenge the status quo and unleash untapped revenue potential with this incredible team. It is a women-owned RevOps consultancy with over 16 years in direct sales, operations, and enablement experience. So if you are looking to optimize in a unique and wonderful way, Reach out to the founder, Laura Wheeler, on LinkedIn or visit renegadeoperations.com to learn more. And that brings me finally to Luster. Luster is scaling sales practice with custom-built conversational okay. AI technology by providing sales teams with the ability to master calls, simulations, and skill drills that are going to mimic your real-world customer and prospect interactions. They are unique because they are built by go-to-market experts for go-to-market teams and they are exposing yeah. enablement ROI and bringing predictive enablement to the hands of all. Visit luster.ai to learn more and get some hands on the beta version. And now that we've done that and covered those fine folks, <laughs> Jody, you are the chief product officer and one of my co-founders at Luster. Tell us your journey. <laughs> How the heck <laughs> you got there. It's a beautiful thing. Tell us the tale. Oh man, it has been such a wonderful journey. It's so wonderful when you feel like all of your past 25 years, and even longer than that, I would say, have really come to a confluence and a convergence of all the things you're passionate about, the things you love doing, the skills you feel like you're good at, the areas you want to grow. Uh, so yeah, I've been in this space really for 25 years. I started as a freshman in college, building technology for the university. So that is where a lot of my passion has come from education. My mom was a psychology professor. My dad led technology at the university. And so I actually started in sales, which is funny, was selling computers. And in the back, there were people who were setting up the computers and everything like that. So I was like, that looks like a lot of fun. So had no training at all. And, uh, you know, that wasn't at that time something I was, you know, looking into, but had gone in the back and really learned, was setting up these computers and like found this passion for technology, but also left psychology. So continued with my degree there, but worked at the university, like building all the websites for a lot of these distance education, which wasn't a thing 25 years ago, really. It was brand, brand new. The technology wasn't super advanced as far as like online courses. But it was a lot of like single moms. Like when we were talking to people, things like that, there were a lot of like moms who were trying to get their master's degrees and things like that. And so got really passionate about, wow, technology can actually help people learn and grow. And so I would say that's where a lot of the mission-driven part, purpose-driven part of what I love about that, where I've ended up really started and where it was earned. There's such like education is such an upward mobility. It really helps people uh, be able to realize their dreams and bring their confidence in. So it's something that's just like is ingrained in every part of everything that I that I love doing. Uh, and so 
I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> I'm like, keep, I'm just like sitting back, busy eating popcorn. Like, what a beautiful story. Okay, perhaps this is me being somewhat naive. How did you know, from a technical standpoint, how to do those things? Like you mentioned, it started when you were in college, b- yeah. building out something technical like like how had you gone to school or like camps earlier for that were you just yeah. the kind of person that's like i'm gonna figure it out were you like parroting on your parents shoulders watching them because i have to be honest if you were to put me even what i know now right 17 years in tech if you were to put me into the scenario that you went into when you were in college yeah i'd be like it's like i always say help the potato i don't know how to <laughs> how, how how did you know how to do that where did that skill come from yeah, that's a great question. I am completely self-taught. So back in, I, you know, back in the day, we used to download software. And so I taught myself HTML and JavaScript and, you know, kind of got a job saying, hey, I will learn anything. And I'm passionate about this. And here's why I care about like being a part of this team because they were starting this web development team. Uh, and so I was like, I love, I love doing that. And they're like, Hey, do you want to join and like lead the team? I'm like, great. I'm going to lead a bunch of people. I don't know how to do these skills. So I led a team of student developers, you know, and taught myself Dreamweaver and all these different things. And, you know, there wasn't YouTube or anything back in the day. So I literally wrote like oh, read sick. like O'Reilly books, like, you know, those big books that like <laughs> that any engineer will have them on their desk. That And so, yeah, that was like a big part of my journey. I'm just like a very curious person. And I love to just really not, like just jump right in. When I wanted to learn how to hike, I did a 14. That was like my first thing, you know, it's like, you know, you just don't have any anxiety. You just like jump into the deep end of the pool and you do something that's hard, even if it's messy and you don't look good doing it. You know, it makes everything else. It's just like, yeah, I can, I can learn those other things. Uh, you're saying this so nonchalantly. Like, <laughs> no. So as it turns out, I'm like entirely self-taught. That's <laughs> because again, there wasn't YouTube. There, There was not this Ooh. wealth of being able to go and search how to do this very, very yeah. technical thing and watch somebody do it. So the fact that, and it doesn't surprise me, right? Knowing you like <laughs> I know you now, your your brain just does kind of work like that. But I do think a lot of people would approach what you've done with the mentality of like, I'm just going to figure it out. But the fact that yeah. you not only did, but developed such a high level of proficiency. Talk to us about the first tech company that you worked at where you were yeah. in a product facing role and how it translated from, I'm going to train myself. I'm going to be asked to do some extra things to like, I am now sitting in the seat where this organization is relying on me and you had to put that self-taught acumen to the test. Tell us about that. Yeah. So I, I really wanted to learn everything about technology. And so it was the engineering piece. I did product design because of my psychology background. I had done UX design. So I was able to really my first startup where I think I really got into, you know, being in a a product role and making these big decisions with a company called examiner.com. And it was an Anschutz company. It was really great. It was their first tech company ever. And so it was a great place to learn where everybody was just, hey, very experimental. Like, let's just try anything. And I actually got my first product job because they didn't have product managers <laughs> at this time. And they were like, hey, do you want to be a product? And I had been doing their design and their product design. And, and I was like, okay, what is product manage? Literally Googling it at this point. <laughs> and, you know, so that was really wayfinding. There wasn't a lot of, time. it was kind of a new field, right? And so again, it was something where I was like, hey, let's find some some people who are in the space. Let's find us some mentors. There weren't courses or boot camps or anything like that. Uh, and so that was just a really interesting forte where it was really like, here's the goals the company is trying to achieve. And here's where we're at. Like, how do we connect the dots and build steps towards getting there? And that strategic journey was something that just really lit me up. It was like, how do we take from where we are today? And we can observe that. We can see that. And we have this grand vision of where we want to be and the difference we want to make in the world and being the person who can really like draw the dotted line to like the plan to get there. To me, that was just like such a fun adventure and such a challenge. And so I really fell in love with product because honestly, I love doing all those pieces and product was really something where you, you're in the technology, you're talking to customers, you're working with users. 
Uh, and so it was just like the perfect mesh of everything and making sure that you're solving problems that you care about, that you're able to make an impact and money for the business. So it was just like, that's really what I fell in love. And I'm like, this is product. This is the great, and it's funny, like when I, when I talk to people, like, what do you do? Like product, I was like, it's the greatest job in the world. You really get to do all these pieces, which is wonderful. Well, and I think it can accidentally sometimes feel like this catch-all. Exactly. And, and it is in a lot of the sense, right? Because I think what's interesting about your field is you have to be able to guide the roadmap. You have to be able to understand enough technical components to make the right decisions. You have to do a heavy amount of project management. You have to do customer success and customer support and make those decisions. And have you found that it's been interesting being in this field with people not necessarily understanding some of the nuances between, say, like one of the conversations you and I had early on in Luster was, do you hire a chief product officer or a chief technical yeah. officer? And people yeah. feel like these are two very different things. In your experience, where's some of the overlap there? And how do you kind of pick a side of the fence? Yeah. And honestly, it's the best part about product, what I love, is you really have to flex into whatever the business needs. And so that's what I think is really fun about the role is sometimes you need to be more technical. And I have had to play all those different roles. Sometimes you need to determine what your infrastructure is going to look like. Sometimes you really need to coach people to be more, to coach your team to be more strategic or like that was the case um, at Ibotta, right? So we were focused on like, we had 33 squads and how do you get them to all operate towards a common vision, right? And so sometimes it's really like the leadership, the visionary piece of it. So what I really enjoyed about this role is you kind of go in and you're like, what are you trying to achieve? What do you really need to do? What team do you have? What are your skills? And how can we leverage all of that to achieve this great goal together, right? And so you can kind of flex into any of those roles. And for me, I'm, I'm an ever learner. I always say like, you know, I would just go back to school and just be in school forever. Like I <laughs> aren't learning new things. I am a tinker. I'm curious. And so it's such a great fit for me because I'm like, hey, you know, maybe this next role requires me to, like here, I am doing the infrastructure, <laughs> we're doing the infrastructure design, we're doing architectural design, we're doing data design, you know, AI and ML, all these very technical things. And so those are all things where I get to spend my time and energy doing that and learning new things and doing new things and using the experience I've had in the past. And it's just, uh, it's a great space to be. Oh. It's funny when you mentioned the going back. I like to think that I am a forever learner as well. Like I love learning new things. But this idea specifically, if like I would go back to school, Jody, you couldn't, you couldn't hide me enough. I actually have a recurring nightmare that for some reason my high school has yeah. turned into like this labyrinth, and I'm late for class, and I can't find my class and then I realize I forgot a book in my locker and then I get to my locker and I don't remember the combination and I wake up the full cold sweat <laughs> cold sweats being like my god so learning yes you are yeah. a fascinating human that you would want to go back to I love it for you I really do I I am not oh, a great like, the books and like you know <laughs> work. That's there. That's like oh that was just oh. I love it I loved oh, everything I, about school. If I, I, yeah, I wouldn't have stayed Jody, there. <laughs> I just, I love it for you. I really do. I do. I think it's a great journey for you. Yeah. And if we think about the seat that you've wound up in, one, you've built this long path of acumen. And I think more than most folks that I've met, you have such a balance of the product side, the leadership side, the design side, the technical side. Like you are very much in my opinion, a unicorn product person, because I mean, and you know, like a lot of times, and it's okay, people are not that multifaceted. Can you think of times in your career where you've been challenged because maybe you've had a difficult time owning the product roadmap yeah. or you've made decisions that you realized were not the right ones or gone along with decisions that aren't the right ones because it's difficult when there's somebody like you that has so much acumen and then you come across, like now you're working with a tech team and there are technical people in the room and a CEO in the room and a sales leader in the room and, and you're sitting there trying to guide everybody and it gets out of your hands a little bit. So talk yeah. to us a little bit about some scary moments in your past. Let's relive some yes. of your traumas right <laughs> yeah. here on live. Yes. Like I have lots of battle scars, lots and lots of them and speak about them very openly. I would say if I look back on the totality of my there's really two big buckets. One of them falls into these self-limiting beliefs that we often have. And again, like, I, I, you know, and it's 
I didn't come from Stanford. I don't have these degrees. And there's all these beliefs about if you're going to be like a technical person, you know, if you're going to be in products, like you need to have this certain pedigree. There's an archetype, right? And I didn't really fit a lot of those items, right? And so again, like I remember when I was at, at Way and then a wonderful mentor there. And she was like, hey, we need to, we're looking at raising our Series C and I want you to help drive this. And I was like, what is a Series C? I was like fairly early on in my career. And she was like, she was like, can you do that? I was like, absolutely. (laughs) You can, yes. (laughs) But the palpitations in my car were just like, it was, it's a scary moment to volunteer for something. But then just when you have the, hindsight of 2020 and you go back and yeah I did those things but in the moment I was thinking like I can't do this like I'm not the person who has these skills like you know but you figure it out and you do it and I played a major role in being able to do that and then also when I was at Ibotta they were going through a big transition and uh, there were some new competitors who came into the market uh, and so we were just seeing usage of the app going down and up the business the need and seed aspect of the app was the whole business right and so we had to like step back right and we were like there's got to be another strategic opportunity here and so obviously they went public uh recently based on this big strategic shift that i was lucky enough to be a part of when i was there and they made this amazing you know these uh b2b business and platform where they're powering rewards for some of the biggest or the biggest retailers, uh, and they are a big player in the space, and it's been a huge success. And at that time, I was like, wow, like this is hard to be in this position. And, and again, like I had amazing mentors, and just like that is one of the best organizations I have ever been a part of, as far as just like smart, strategic, great technicians. Uh, and so I was very lucky, and I really learned so much there. So I would say, like, that bucket of like, I'm not the person to do this. How can I be a part of this? Like, I don't have the right skill set. Like sometimes you just have to say, I will figure it out, right? And you have to have that confidence in yourself. And so again, that is one thing I would love to coach women is specifically on is like, we tend to be very hard on ourselves. The step, the stat I like to share a lot is like most of the time women will only apply for a job if they meet 80% of the criteria of a job description, whereas typically men will will apply to a job when they meet 30% of the criteria. Or like zero. <laughs> <laughs> and so it is something that is just good awareness, right? It's good awareness. And so that has been one bucket that has been vulnerably a big challenge for me in the past. I think the other area is what you're getting to, which is like this being able to own the roadmap, right? A lot of times you are, even when you're the head of product or you're VP of like a lot of times it's very challenging because you have a lot of other people who want to own the roadmap when the the technology is your product uh you know and so it's very hard to work through some of those conversations with especially when there's a difference in priorities and things like that and so that has been something that is always a challenge and every leadership team is completely different right the dynamics are there are different how people approach problem solving is different And so that has always been something that has been, uh, it's always challenging when you're in uh, that role. So I would say those are kind of the two big buckets that have been challenging. Well, and they're big ones. And I feel like a lot of people can relate. Like my my very first role at a startup, right? So this is a long time ago. We're talking maybe 2011, um, a tech startup. I remember that I had been a very successful account executive there. I had worked my way up. I was a frontline manager, one of the top frontline managers. And I remember sitting in a leadership meeting and they had just brought in like a new CRO type of role. And he was talking about how as a company, they decided they were going to lean heavily on MBAs for all director and above level leadership. And this was my first voray into technology. And at that point in time, like you don't even know what you can dream for, right? Like you're in this larger than life environment and you see all of these brilliant people and it's moving quickly and there's a lot of money and affluence and you're like i am just trying to keep up like i in my mind i was like i am just a former theater major that comes from a family of artists i don't belong here right and like that's in the back of your mind and i remember when he was like the only way to get to director vp and above at this organization is you got to have an mba like we yeah. are not going to be looking at folks who don't have that yeah and there was this moment where i was like oh my god 
Like, I just have a bachelor's degree from college. Like, I'm never, I'm never going to be worthy or have the acumen to be a director or a VP or C-suite. And so it was this defeating moment in my early 20s that got in my head for a while. Yeah. And then it's crazy because that CRO was like chased out of town with pitchforks like an ogre because apparently other people didn't like that either. Mm -hmm. And then I had the opportunity to move into leadership yeah. and learn on the job. And now 17 years later, it's like, boom, here we are. But it can it can be eroding and deteriorating yeah. so early in your career to have that kind of doubt and be like, oh my God, I'm not... I'm not enough. Yes. And speaking of wild things, let's take a moment to tap on our sweat glands a little bit. <laughs> Jody, tell the people where tech debt comes from. <laughs> and why, and I'm bringing this up because your second pain point for me was like, I remember the first time I heard that term was like, we have a ton of tech debt. And I was like, what does that mean? Like, I was like, I yeah. had never, what does that, what does that mean? Yeah. And it is a thing that I think is one of the number one poisons that ends startups is tech debt. Yes. Tell us how you fall in that trap. Yes. That was a really great question. And I want to separate out, there is actually good tech debt and there Ooh. is bad tech debt. So yes, I love this. If you are coding everything 100% correct, you have unit tests, everything's perfect, you're moving too slow. So there is tech debt that is okay because it is good to do something experimental, to know that it's there, to track it, to come back when you've realized it. Because one thing you can do that is also detrimental, and this goes into a lot of my learnings, which is like, you really need to be experimental and you need to come out with something. Sometimes you're doing things manually on the back end and you create this great customer experience, right? So there are things like it is okay to have tech debt in that sense where you're moving quickly, you know where it is, and you have a plan to follow up if it's successful. So you have it over invested in something. Mm -hmm. Really the shadow side of, tar of tech debt. And I have been at multiple organizations I think there is a growing just acumen around how to not incur these things in the beginning. But a lot of times, and it, it, especially because I've been a lot part of a lot of early stage startups, you start out and you hire someone who's not as experienced or on the technical side. And you're just not building things very future facing. So thinking about things like how your data should be structured, those are ghosts. <laughs> and skeletons that will be in your closet as long as the product exists, right? And so those are the things where there are, and again, like this just comes from a lot from experience, knowing the things where you need to measure twice, cut once, and the things that you can actually move forward with very quickly and then come back to. So there is actually just like a ton of strategy behind the tech debt that's good tech debt that allows you to move quickly experiment versus bad tech debt that will literally take your entire roadmap. And I am then a part of, unfortunately, a couple different organizations where that has been a big challenge, where uh, we really, you want to focus on, we're talking to customers, we're learning about new things, new, new competitors are coming through in the market, and you're able to react to that. And you're able to spend, let's say that you have $100 to spend in your investment bucket. If you can spend 100% of that on new technology that helps you be more competitive, help sales, that's amazing right? And that's never going to happen because there's always these other things you need to do. But the higher you can get that, the more competitive you're going to be. And if you are bogged down, it's like a, an anchor you know, attached to you. And if you're bogged down and you're spending, you know, if you're spending 80, 80 of those $100 on just fixing and refactoring things that already exist and making them so that they are, are not buggy and things like that, it's a huge sink to your competitive nature. And at the end of the day, I'm extremely just customer centric. And at the end of the day, it really impacts the customer experience, right? And so you are getting things that are, you know, breaking, they're unstable. There's like just weird wonky logic in there that uh, makes the experience really challenging and unusable. friendly. And so those are things where like there is good tech debt. There's of most companies. And again, like this, I would say there's probably 90% of companies out there have just like really challenging tech. So it's been really great having some of that hindsight going into building something brand new and saying, here's the things where we're going to come back. 
And that's okay because we don't want to overinvest until we have a lot of validation that this is great. But there are areas where like, we're going to make sure that we have a very solid foundation and this is going to be a really stable, trustworthy, amazing customer experience. Oh. And like, that's kind of where there's this amalgam of all of your experience when you're now at the helm and in the driver's seat. And suddenly it's like, hey, the decision for tech debt, like you have the final call on that. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking through what it is um, and how it can hurt organizations, it feels like the kind of thing that would be very easy to avoid, right? Like everyone be like, ooh, that's going to be mm -hmm. tech debt. That's bad. What do you think are some of the things, especially at startup organizations, that lead to tech debt, even though it feels like it would be easy to avoid? Yeah. Like, What are some of the landmines that people can look out for mm -hmm. and kind yeah. of stand up and raise their hand and be like, hey, we're about to take on some bad tech debt here. Like, We need to take a step back. Yeah. Like, How do you get awareness around that? Yeah, I'd say that falls into a couple buckets. I think one of them is just not understanding your customers. It really comes down to that piece of it. A lot of, there's this thing called Conway's Law. Right. And so your architecture is based on your team culture. It is a reflection of that because you build based on what you know and, and everything. So your product is only going to be good as good as your understanding of your customers. And so if you don't really understand what they're doing, what their organizations look like and, and things like that. So that's the thing I always tell like, go talk to your customers. And so because then you're actually refactoring like strategic business logic of like how something needs to work. And those become constraints that actually make it hard for you to create something that's really easy to use and seamless. So like that is one that I see that unfortunately is like way complicated, not hard to talk to customers, right? <laughs> like, you know, like I have done everything from like giving people like $5, like Starbucks gift cards that I've bought out of my own package to like, hey, I will talk about you here, like whatever it takes, like very gorilla, yeah. like it's very easy actually go talk to customers. It's surprising how many people do that. I would say the other one is really, again, just hiring really amazing technical talent, right? Because there are, coding is very much an art form as well, right? And so just like writing music, you can write really messy music or you can write things that really sound harmonious together. And programming is no different. Uh, being able to create an architecture that doesn't paint you in the corner, that leaves open things that could happen in the future, that's aware of unknowns so that you have a lot of room for it to grow and it doesn't constrain. So those are like a couple of the big things that we see that happen is just, I truly believe in hiring the most competent, talented team ever. And like that is true of product, product design, marketing, engineering, everything. Like people and talent matter. <laughs> Oh, they matter so much. They're everything. Yeah. I mean, your 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 people are 100% what are either going to cause you to succeed yeah. or fail. Yeah. And it's interesting sitting at the table and watching instances, even in my own career, where I've seen this idea of like, we are making the wrong decisions with mm -hmm. our product that are going to bite us. It's like, it, it feels like it comes from, to your point, you sold a couple of customers early on because right. early on, you want the revenue, right? And you're like, hey, we can be a little bit yes. flexible, a little bit loosey-goosey. You're selling customers before you've identified product market fit, before yes. you've really identified what are the KPIs and the outcomes of this product going to be? Who are we targeting? And what is a need to have versus a nice to have? Yeah. Like, oh my gosh, so much tech debt is like, you'd be so cool if it could do this and you focus on that. Meanwhile, customers are like, we need this one thing to function, right? And so it's interesting being at a table and hearing Say like, okay, well, this one big customer that we sold super early on is providing the majority of our revenue. And if we lose that customer, that's really bad for the business. But now that we've evolved, that customer is not really the right yeah. customer for us anymore. And so then you have to make the decision of, do we say no to their product requests yeah. because they're going to impact the roadmap for our actual PMF customers or... Do you impact the roadmap to keep the big customers that are keeping the lights on happy? That feels like an impossible decision sometimes. And so as a last question before we pivot to our rapid reveal, give our lovely product people some advice on if they're sitting at a table and this discussion is happening, yeah. right? Our big customer wants this feature and functionality, but it is no longer part of what will give us long-term product market yeah. fit. 
What advice would you give product leaders in that moment as to how to navigate that conversation? Uh, and this is why you're such a great partner to work with because this, <laughs> especially early, early on in these days, like it really does set the precedence for how you're going to operate. And in, in the product world, we call it, you're either a sales organization or a product organization. Ooh. And so, yes. And so it's very early on, especially in the beginning where you're just like, we just need revenue, right? You don't have all Somebody the sick girls, you don't need everything. And this is very, very common. And so you end up with like customers who don't have like a common pattern, you know, a common problem. So you're really doing a shotgun strategy, which really is not a strategy at all, right? And so it takes a lot of discipline in the very beginning to say, this is the problem we solve. These are the people we solve it for. And if you're not a good fit, like it's better for us to part ways as friends or even help them find a solution at the end of the day that's going to solve the problem for them. But like, it's very important and very strategic for you to really focus on like, what are the problems we're solving? Who do we solve that problem for? And tune out a lot of the noise. I am a fit apart, again, like, three organizations, you know, in my career before where I come in kind of the second wave. So now we have all these customers, but there's a lot of customers in there that are not good fit. And and really, I own retention. Like at the end of the day, like, are people happy with the product? Are we solving the problem? Are they being retained? And honestly, the best way to grow your retention is to fire bad fit customers. And that's like a really harsh thing to say, but it's, it really is like, you need to focus on making sure you have the right customer. So building that relationship and being able to work really closely, both go to market, marketing and products have to be aligned on where are they, who are the people that they're solving the problem for and when they're going to say no. Right. So one of the things is like you have to be aligned on that ideal customer profile and the problem that you're solving and how your solution is going to solve that problem. And even if you're sometimes it makes sense to solve if you're like, hey, these guys are aligned with our vision and we aren't there. Be up right and say, hey, we're going there. We're not there now. And sometimes that is a good fit, right, because they can really be a design partner for you and help you build the right product and do the validation along the way. But that also takes a certain level of sophistication to make sure that you're not just building it for one customer, right? So it's a challenge um, and it takes a, a lot of discipline, but write it down, be aligned on uh, with all of your partners and say strategically, like these are the customers we're sur serving. These are what, this is what we're going to say. No, be really clear on that. And it will save you a lot of trouble <laughs> down the line. Uh, it's beautiful advice. I feel like it's, uh, it's being able to speak to what is the right thing and then trusting the fact that if you hire professionals, listen to them and empower yeah. them, right? And I think that's a lot of where you see difficulty at a C-suite table when you're drilling into things like product and success yeah. and avoiding churn is there's a lot of panic that happens in that room. And there's a lot of forgetting that you've likely hired brilliant people, trust them. And so yeah, trust the people that you yeah, hire. They're, sub they're subject matter experts and they're looking at it in a very different way. I think we all have very different disciplines for a reason, right? We're looking at it from a different angle. And so when you can sit down and have a really open, honest conversation that is vulnerable, that says, here's what I'm seeing and, and, and then figure out how you're going to measure it. At the end of the day, just looking at the data, it just takes so much temperature out of the I'm of the opinions, right? How are we going to measure this, right? So it's a very experimental mindset that really helps for everyone just to look at the data, sit at the same side of the table, and say, how are we, how are we going to measure this? How are we going to know? How are we going to test this hypothesis and uh, move forward together? So it is way easier to say than it is <laughs> way easier in theory than it is in practice. It is something everyone has to really work on together. Well, we could talk about <laughs> those fun qualitative moments all day, <laughs> but it brings me to our yeah. rapid reveal section where I have three questions for you. You have 60 seconds or less to answer each. Are you down for this? I read it. It's like a game show. I know this is, that's what it is. You're on a game show now. <laughs> like the like cash cab. Like, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Welcome to Rapid Reveal. Fresh <laughs> number one, and this one was slightly leading because I know you, but I wonder where you're going to take it. What's a unique hobby <laughs> of yours if you were to just yeah. choose one? Sure. Yeah. So I'll say I am a hobby collector. That is kind of my hobby. As I mentioned, I always like to learn. I always like to take, I do everything from cross stitching to watercolor and eggs to like, I do so many things. But what I would say is the most unique one that people, 
people are always really, oh, that's interesting. I love to train crows. It was something that I got into. I, and these are like wild crows. These are not like crows that I have in my house. Um, I I one word. Again, like my background is like your run of the mill crow in the house. This is wild crows. This is not. <laughs> these are wild. These are wild, wild, wild crows. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> and I saw this thing where you could actually train them to. I actually had a, a friend who, who started this, and I learned. I love like behavioral psychology and it's like you can actually train them to bring you things uh and so i would set out an egg and water in these little shiny objects i got at a yard sale like little jimmy gem things uh so <laughs> would set those out as like presents and dog food and i had these three crows that would continually come back to the house and i could move it closer to the house and then we got kind of close with that our own space and they would bring me little presents every now and again. So the best thing I got was, I, I thought it was like a real engagement ring, but it was, you know, just like a cubic zirconia. But they deposited it. So, you know, thanks for the raw egg. Here's a ring for you. So that's one of my more fun ones. <laughs> I just feel like it reminds me of that movie Dunstan checks in with like the monkey that robs people. And you're like, Jody checks in and you're there like with your crows. Is there a difference between a crow and a raven or are they the same thing just depending on the level of poetry or prose that you're yeah, right. they, they are they are different species like we have a lot more crows here uh but crows are really smart ones right they uh they have ravens are kind of dumb <laughs> they're yeah. not quite as far as crows. they have like okay. crows have like the largest like brain to body ratio like they attend funerals of their like loved ones yeah they're they also like they love to like mess with other animals which i love they're kind of like mobsters they're i don't know they're, they're pretty cool <laughs> this i google that it's fun i just feel like there should be a whole episode on this because now i wonder if like ravens realize they're being dogged like this yeah. <laughs> you know ravens are like yeah. stupid crows they're like yeah. not, their brain size is so much smaller okay number two <laughs> that was a good one <laughs> get it together <laughs> Number two, what's an irrational fear of yours? Balloons. I hate balloons. Balloons? Yes. Uh, I basically hate anything that pops. Like, it's, you know, it's like, uh, so like the biscuits and things like that or champagne bottles. Okay. I love champagne. So I have learned, it, so. I have worked through that on years. Yep. Like, so I can now pop champagne, but it's it's like an adult jack in the box and it just, it terrifies me. I went out to this, um, you know, I was being cool this year. I went out to an actual club for like, uh, for uh, New Year's Eve, and they did a balloon drop, and I thought I was just going to like, I didn't have a panic attack. I was like, there's balloons everywhere. So, and they're gonna pop everywhere. Yeah, you know that like yeah. terrible thing you used to do at camp where you would have a balloon and you had to like get in between, you had to get like two people together, and they had to pop yeah. the balloon. Like nightmare, nightmare. Okay, okay. this no is balloons. this is great to know. No balloon, no balloons That's for Jody. We're not gonna go there. <laughs> Um, number three, our last and final, what's your favorite self-care tip? Yeah, self-care. So what I would say is really focusing on a practice that helps you be present. Uh, I love the quote, you know, that depression comes from focusing on your past and anxiety comes from focusing on your future. And yeah. this was so true for me. The last few years have been really tough. Like I've had a teenager with mental health issues. I went through a divorce. I had moved houses. I, it was just like a really, there's so many bad scenarios that you can go through in as you're going through these really tough moments. And so I, again, a teacher trying to learn everything. I did everything I could to learn to be present, to really focus on like today you're safe. You have house. You're okay. Like you're okay. Happy. Yeah. And thank you. So I've done everything from relational meditation to ecstatic dance to, uh, <laughs> you know, like tapping meditation. I spent a really long time building this practice of learning to be present and not focusing on the future because you just have to trust that when you get in that moment, that you will find a way that you, whatever comes up, that you can be resilient, that you can be powerful, that you can be resourceful, that you will figure it out. And so don't waste your time and energy thinking about those things. Focus on being grateful today and being where you are now. And that honestly has been my survival technique the last couple of years and something I just, uh, I'm a big believer in. Well, that packed a punch. Damn, I was, I'm sitting here like, I could do anything. I mean, like it is, 
I am lucky enough that getting to work with you, I get to be exposed to your brilliance and your kindness every single day. And everyone I got you. To this, you know, like we're just we're just two moms making it in the world in tech. If we just try in our best, yeah. where can folks find you, connect with you, yep. learn more about Miss Jody Mesa, CPO and co-founder of Lustre.ai. Where can they find you? Yeah, I love to meet new people. Just hit me up on LinkedIn is really the best place to connect with me. So Jody Mesa, just straight up. Yeah, pretty easy. Jody with an I. Jody with an I. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I would love to connect. I do a lot with women in leadership, women coaching, women mentoring. I just I was so lucky to have so many mentors and so many great partners, and I would not be here without having such a wonderful network of people. And if there's anything I can ever do to help you or have, you know, my 25 years of experience that could you know benefit you or mean some brainstorming or you're going through a tough time, yeah, that is. Feel free to reach out. Well, R.I.P. to your inbox after that. Um, <laughs> true to form as always, Jody. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, thanks for having me. That's all, folks. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Taking the Lead. If you're looking for more inspiring stories from women leaders in B2B tech, then visit us at motionagency.io slash taking the lead.